Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again. This is a Goat and the Fox Talk About Movie. I'm Daniel. And I'm Raynard. And today, we are sponsored by King's Hawaiian Rolls. King's you know? Hawaiian, where you can meet Rocket Raccoon and all his alien friends for a big ol' happy barbecue. Hey Pops, what's cooking? <laughs> I was watching this movie and I was like, you know what I eat right now? A bunch of pulled pork sliders on sweet roll buns. It's exactly the kind of mood this puts me in. King's Hawaiian Rolls. Buy them. <laughs> we need to practice when we actually You're get a slick things. salesman. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, well, today we are talking about <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. The latest, and I think it's going to be our last Marvel movie that we plan to see. Oh, I'm done. Um, Can I tap out yeah. now? <laughs> uh, free at last. We are free at last. Now the Marvels is coming out, and we're never going to be able to, you know, watch any other content. Kevin Feige wills it so. <laughs> well, Kevin Feige can can stop. You can stop. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I think before we talk about this, we'll kind of talk about, like, you know, what we think of the, the I guess, the little mini franchise within the franchise. So, Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, I, I actually talked about this a little bit in, like, my superhero fatigue video, but it's like, I really liked that first one. Like, for me, like, Granted, I wasn't a cinephile back then. I didn't watch that much, but for me, like it kind of felt like almost like a shot in the arm. I was like, "Oh my gosh!" It felt so refreshing in terms of like, you know blockbuster action kind of stuff. Um, and the second one is pretty pretty good. I still like the first one. It feels like more focused, but the second one's like this is pretty good. Um, but I I've not seen the holiday special. I think that's like that's one thing kind of get out of the way here is like I haven't seen that so I guess we haven't seen the full piece of this arc unfortunately but I just I I I really fell off of that Disney Plus Marvel stuff very quickly. Yeah, I I can't do the television content. I did I watched my way through like WandaVision and Moon Knight and I just started like the cost to benefit ratio just started tipping for me and I'm like I'm not gonna get burned by this again I'm out I'll watch the movies and that's it and like it kind of is starting to feel like there's something of like a a buy-in you have to do to watch it like if you've seen not seen Guardians the holiday special you'll have no idea about these sorts of things or whatever so I don't know I'm in the same boat there but yeah I have, I have a similar I guess experience with the first two of the James Bond films here. I really, really like Guardians 1. I would even go as so far as to say it's the best just MCU film bar none, I think. Just because, yeah. I don't know, I, I feel like, especially in the earlier phases, you a big part of like the discourse or whatever was, well, they're good at kind of finding subgenres for these films and like, pigeon, you know, um, Ant-Man could be a heist movie, or Winter Soldier could be a political thriller, a paranoid kind of espionage thriller, and, and those that's true, and they're both successful at those in those examples, but I, I think the thing that you missed there is you had to put the word Marvel in front of that, it's a Marvel political thriller, and it's not, like there's other, you know, if you want to see a political thriller, go watch like the Parallax View or something, I don't know, that's far more exciting and better. Whereas, like, Guardians 1 managed to transcend that kind of paradigm, and it was just good on its own merits, and I was excited for these characters, and I was interested in them. I certainly think it helps that we as a general public didn't know any of these characters, so you don't have the baggage coming in of, like, a Captain America or something. But, again, Gunn was able to push past that and create just a fun movie with exciting moments and lovable characters and stuff and two does that to slightly diminishing returns again it's still head and shoulders better than a lot of the other movies that in this kind of group but it was i was starting to get concerned about some of the decisions being made with like drax becoming more of like a punching bag for instance or 
it becoming a little bit more jokey jokey and losing a little bit of that sincerity but you know again i was still on the wagon i think what's interesting is that in a way that the first guardians movie really jolted the entire franchise like up to that point there's like a very specific feel to it. it was like the joss whedon kind of feel to it um and then when james gunn came in like that aesthetic that that feel he brought with the first guardians movie that took over the marvel cinematic universe you see yeah. that especially like like you know the thor movies like thor ragnarok takes a lot more from the guardians than the other thor movies even yeah well and it uh, infected the just the that genre in general like you see the original uh suicide squad is like oh they, we should put music in our movies okay let's make 80 back-to-back -back music videos and stuff so people are kind of getting the wrong there's a sea change so people are maybe getting the wrong lesson learned it's actually funny to say because it's like because definitely like that you know the the first suicide squad movie they saw the success of the guardians and they saw the non-success of batman versus superman they're like oh we have to make it like this and then it was awful and then and then they rebooted it with actual james gunn it's like this feedback loop except it actually turned out really good when gunn did it because yeah. he actually likes to make good movies and i do think that this movie that we're going to be talking about today coming out in like a post uh suicide squad gun version like it's definitely an important aspect too and i think it's something that's very interesting to dig into absolutely and we'll get right into that let's start with like you know basic summary yeah. so in this movie rocket gets attacked like the whole team is in nowhere that a base there rocket gets attacked and they need to save him but it turns out that his implants won't let anybody like mess with his body and so they have to go find the guy that made rockets to get the code so that they can do magic space surgery on him and save his life and then in the meanwhile we get these flashbacks about you know rockets from point from his point of view about how he was created and the evil high evolutionary who wants to make the galaxy perfect and things kind of go from there. So, kind of get into like our more like spoiler free discussion here. Um, and just, yeah, so overall, what was your opinion of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3? Overall, on kind of a high level, um, just sort of general take, I think this is brings out kind of the strongest elements of these the two previous movies but also kind of its weaker elements i am probably going to be harder on this film than you are from our kind of discussion beforehand um i think that it's really it was interesting to focus a lot of the movie on uh, rocket's character on uh, i think he's the most interesting of the group overall and we know that he's got this kind of checkered past that's been alluded to from the outset and so it's interesting to dig into that and also i think it's a good sort of emotional sort of anchor point to tie the rest of the movie to or a lot of the rest of the movie to i also didn't really like any other aspects of the film that much like they're fine they're okay and we'll you know touch on all of it i like little bits here and there but i really would have preferred the film to just focus on that through line i think a lot of the there's a lot of other stuff going on which kind of bloats it yeah i compared this in a couple discussions actually this movie kind of gives me some last jedi kind of vibes in a sense where it's it is uneven it is messy not everything clicks for me but the things that do click really really stick with me it's like when it has its highs they're very very high but then a good chunk of the movies is like oh that's it's, it's, it's all right it's all right because it's you know everything having to do with rocket storyline like you said that was really strong for me you know because uh early on in the movie we see him meet these 
other experiments in the place where he was created. And they're all like cyborg animals. You have Lila the Otter, who has like little robot arms. Um, there's um, Floor and Teeths. Um, and they're like, you know, they're a walrus. Um, and I was like, you know, like his eyes are peeled open and everything. The rabbit, like this mask and wheels around. And like, this is the moment where you kind of see James Gunn's magic at work because there are all these like, it's almost like kind of like monstrous kinds of a things. It, it, it reminds me of, like, you know, in Toy Story. Yeah, I was going to say like, it's Sid. big like Sid's <laughs> uh, misfit toys energy, especially the rabbit. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess he's seen Toy Story. Yeah, it's um, and this is it's this really endearing thing. Like, there's this one shot where Lila's like, oh, you know, like you know, you know, little raccoon, you got your head's hurt, you got some blood on there. Let me dab it off for you. And just like that moment, it's like close up shot. This this intimate moment has more emotion in that one shot than any movie we've seen from this franchise in the past couple years. And the fact that he's able to elicit this emotion from this bizarre scenario is, I think, like, one of his great strengths as a filmmaker. is the ability to find empathy and humanity in very strange places. Yeah, I think it's, uh, like, those were definitely some of the more interesting aspects that y you can see him kind of giving himself this challenge. There's a, definitely a sort of glee to just making these weird messed up characters it also and maybe this is just me being cynical but i was watching those and i was understanding those things that he's doing i just wasn't responding to them as rawly as i i would have wanted to i i think uh, lately i'm just like broken or something because i didn't cry during after sun either and apparently i was supposed to i i can intellectualize oh, no. what the emotional impacts were with this film or with that or whatever but it's just like I wasn't when he's he was starting to pull at my heartstrings too. You know, you're getting you have a cute otter and a cute rabbit, and you do something horrible with them, the horrible implications, and and it's just like so many things layered together that it's like okay, it's starting to get a little bit obvious. Whereas like with the first one, it was a little bit more kind of rough around the edges. These emotional beats, which I appealed to me in a little bit more of an authentic way, I suppose. But that's also just that make, me being, you know, a dick. No, that makes sense. No, <laughs> no you, you're not a dick. <laughs> you are not a dick. Not a hundred percent a dick. <laughs> you're not a Modoc. <laughs> oh, I dare not invoke his name. Don't, and don't bring that. <laughs> I've been going to therapy about that fucking movie. <laughs> Um, and to be honest, I, I can kind of see where, where you're coming from, because the moment I kind of saw them, like I saw like a little rabbit walrus, and they're like, oh, they're all being friends, and we're all like dancing, I'm like, they're, they're, they're gonna die. Yeah. Uh, they're gonna die. <laughs> so it's like, it, it is kind of like, like, <laughs> so you, you, you can kind of see the mechanics of it more, whereas like in the first Guardians of Galaxy, it felt more organic, how everything kind of unfolded mm -hmm. um so i can definitely see like it is pretty obvious what's going to happen to them um that said personally i did i i did cry a little bit just a little bit uh, <laughs> i'm going to admit this to you and only to you you can't tell anybody okay. else okay this is, this is the private channel right Th this is the private channel okay. but i i did cry a little bit uh, okay just don't push the green button um, I will say, like, the direction on this, um, like, there's this one, again, like, still being kind of, like, very cute, yeah. but there's this one fight scene near the end where, like, they go into this hallway and there's all, like, the enemies and they got to go through the enemies and it's cut to look like this one long take and I was like, okay, there's this great energy through that whole sequence there. And I was like, this is, this is the money sequence. Yeah, that was really <laughs> right here. You know, you know, like Rocket like leaps up, he's like, ah, and it's like, yeah, that was, that was cool. It was a lot of fun, great energy to that. And I also just liked the design for a lot of this stuff. Like, um, again, not to, 
not to harp on this, this thing anymore. Not to kick it while it's down, but like you look at Quantumania's designs for like the Quantum Realm and everything. And then you look at Orgocorp in this movie, which is like this fleshy planet they have to go to. Um, you can see in the trailer. And you just see like the technology of everything and it, it's night and day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. I think he's good at kind of creating very specific creative visions. Um, He's building off from the previous movies. He's already got his like Ravagers aesthetic and what they look like and what they are doing, and what the Guardians are doing. And now he's layering on this additional one with the Orgo Corp is like this kind of bio, you know, synthetic situation. That's again, it's it's a new thing that we're seeing, but it's a very specific kind of new versus that sort of. And just put some weird crystals in the sky, and we'll just call that even. This feels like there's a logic to what that organization are doing and a very specific kind of vision behind their work. I like their golf ball microphones. Those like little itty bitty things that float, that float, and it's like, oh, that's. I want one of those, please. <laughs> I actually I really found... liked how. Oh, good. I found it hilarious that like they make a big point of how like litigious those people are about their IP. And it's like, hmm, I wonder where this is coming mm. from. <laughs> Nobody mm. does that for real. Going for both right to repair and genetically modified copyrights. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Spicy. Mm. So. And one of the things that was interesting is that how this kind of contrasts with later on, they go to this other planet that just, and again, you see this in another one of the trailers, this... It's basically like a replica of Earth, except it's filled with, uh, with furries. Uh <laughs> Being degenerates, giving each other yeah. meth, beating each other up. <laughs> as would be expected. And, and it was interesting, because like, I feel like, you know, like the, the first set, like all the very outlandish alien designs, it's kind of like, like, okay, no, like, so like, they, they know what they're doing, they're really going full in, and then when you get to like the one that just looks like Earth, but not Earth. And you know, it's like, okay, like that helped it to kind of fit a little bit better. Because I feel like otherwise it'd be easy to pass off as, oh, it's just they're trying to make it easy. <laughs> yeah, and he like in that one, he like there was a lot of attention to detail. It's like I when they went into the one house of the bat woman or whatever the hell. There's all those like J.C. Penny family portrait photos on the wall, and just all these little dorky details that I feel would be glossed over, perhaps in a lazier production. Yeah, it's like you can just tell that a lot of effort went into making the world of this feel more interesting, and that that makes so much difference. You know, it's because I feel like with a lot of these movies, it's just like oh, just green screen everything and then the the, the digital artist can figure it out later mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll change we'll our minds just... eight times and right. yeah you know it's like um yeah but like this one i felt like there was a vision um it's brought to life and like those are the aspects that like really carry this movie for me um because you know like i said a lot of this does kind of feel messy like um Kind of like some of the the shtick of the Guardians is, is kind of wearing thin, like, you know, like, like that, um, that opening scene of the first movie. The, uh, I guess it's not the opening, but like, you know, you arrived like at the, the ruins, it's all kind of creepy, and then Star-Lord like puts on his music, mm -hmm. and just that, you know, hey, 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 as the title appears, like that is a perfect kind of like mood setter there like <laughs> that's going to be like like my thing like that's like a great way to just kick things off mm -hmm. um and then and here like i feel like the needle drops didn't have the same kind of oomph as that um yeah i know, I, I appreciate that he's still keeping it diegetic usually they're either piped through the sort of speaker system of nowhere. I don't give me that power. Like if I could just control the, what if the entire colony <laughs> listens to, that would be that wouldn't end well. Or you know, somebody's listening to my headphones or stuff. So there's like a more of a rooted 
cause or you know like there's a, a source for it which i kind of appreciate but yeah the specific songs he was selecting felt very uh there was just at point there's a couple that i i think we would have to wait till spoilers to actually talk about but there is just felt a lot more random like oh here's this artist from the right era and this is a popular song by them so let's just kind of throw it on and then have it cut out when we need action to happen there's just less intentionality to my ear yeah it might be that you know i picked out like his very favorite songs for the first movie and I had to go to the next tier for the second movie. And on the third movie, I was like, oh, got to get some more. <laughs> uh, PC Boys, yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. And there's just a number. I mean, besides that, like, um, you know, I feel like there's other parts of this that kind of felt like an afterthought. And I think, you know, we're kind of, you know, we'll start getting into spoilers. Uh, but just real quickly um, for folks who might, like, you know, tune out after this, like, would you overall recommend this movie? I'd recommend it to people who see the first two. I suppose it's worth finishing out the trilogy. And then I'd recommend everyone just go watch the first one again. Because you'll yeah. like it. Yeah. Why are we doing recommendations? People already know if they're going to see it. I know, actually. exactly. <laughs> what can I uh, do? This, yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you like the first two, the one's... You know, this is a good, good capper. It's a good capper to everything. Um, so it is now spoiler territory. Um, if you don't go now, then too bad. Darth um, Vader dies. <laughs> <laughs> Adam Warlock. Why is Adam Warlock? You know, poor Will Poulter. Like, he gets... They announced that he cast him. Everyone immediately gets some shit because he looks like Will Poulter. And I think he's, he's fine in the role. I kind of like the, like, I don't know, petulant himbo vibes I was getting from him. But he just kind of doesn't have to exist in the movie at all. Yeah, I was like, and it's, I, I agree with that. Because, like, he was, like, it was kind of fun seeing him in the movie. You know, he had, like, this kind of fun energy. He's like, you know, it's just, like, he's almost like Mom's Boy. was like, he's yeah. evil, but it's just, like, he's just doing what he's told. He's like, oh, the feels bad why do i feel bad mm -hmm. but i just love how like they made this big deal of, like teasing him at the end of the last movie like six years ago and then because i i looked i don't think he's in the holiday special i think this is literally just he just showed up and slammed through the yeah, wall he just like flies into the movie and i'm like <laughs> oh wait what i forgot that he was even <laughs> a character for a moment <laughs> like what the yeah. fuck is going on I was wondering, because like when I went in, I didn't see him in the trailers or anything. I don't think he's in the trailer. So I was like, what are they going to do with him? And then it's like, oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I was like, so I, I'm not sure why he's in the movie. Because while it's, you know, while he does well in the role and he's like fun, I don't know if that's enough to balance out the screen time that he's given. Yeah, I think that there are several elements to this that it's like, okay, well, you put it in, so what? what's the function of this in the greater kind of film slash, like, what are you trying to say with this or do with it? And it just, I, I get, it feels like they're kind of staging him to be, well, now that the Guardians are broken up, who knows what they'll do, but it, there's feels like they're kind of Fast and Furious style, like, rehabbing him, so he starts off as a baddie, and now he's gonna be, like, with the good guys in some capacity, but... Why do I care that he's with the good guys if I don't even really give a shit about him to begin with? Tune in to the Nova Core series in 2025 to find out the adventures of Adam Warlock. That's the real answer. Um, so Star-Lord, Peter, like, he... Again, like, you know, I didn't see the holiday special, and apparently, like, he was, like, kind of, like, a central character there where he's, like, kind of grappling with this. Mm-hmm. But it did feel, like, a little rush to get to where he is, um, because, like, so basically, it's, like, he's still kind of trying to get over Gamora, who, like, the Russo brothers threw Gamora off a cliff in 2018, and James Gunn's like, oh, shit. 
Oh no! <laughs> yeah, how does she come back? I was so confused. Okay. Does she come back during one of the movies? I don't remember. Yeah, so, um, remember, so in Endgame, when the alternate timeline Thanos comes in, he has alternate timeline Gamora. Oh, that's right. So, okay. So, yeah, so this I is remember. like a Gamora. So this is basically the Gomorrah that didn't do the character arc from the first couple movies. Oh, really? She didn't tell me that every eight fucking seconds during the movie. <laughs> uh, um, Was it just me or did like everyone have a very aggressive energy in this film? Everyone's just very angry all the time, but not in like a way that's thematic. It's just the characters are delivering lines in very heated ways at every opportunity yeah. <laughs> kind of got exhausted it, it was it was a little kind of like it you know it feels like there wasn't as much like camaraderies might have seen in even like even like an infinity war kind of felt like they had a good vibe there yeah um maybe that's what happens after you know you 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 die for five years and then come back and then the i get just attacked right. by will poulter yeah. Um, but it did feel a little like, because, you know, when Rocket gets attacked, that kind of takes him out of commission for most of the movie. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, so dynamic does get changed a, a, quite a bit, you know, um, the dynamic is different here and yeah. so I could see like, you know, that, that would make it feel a little bit off. Yeah, it just kind of felt more overall mean-spirited to me in a way that wasn't... Like, Rocket is the guy that always ribs everyone in the first couple, and so with him out of the picture, if you still want that, you have to have that dynamic in some other way. And I feel like they, for some weird reason, used Mantis to fill that. There'd been moments in 2 of like her kind of saying these like cutting things, but in a like, her cutesy way. But here it feels like the ratio is like shifted or something. And it just fell yeah, like, out of character for her especially. And the other characters are just dialed up to 11 over it all. And it just, again, like kind of in a post-Suicide Squad world, it, feel, it felt at points like he was trying to go for that energy when it's not really what the Guardians of the Galaxy has been about previously. I think that's a good point where, like, you know, you, you hit a couple good points there where, um, in the first movie, like, you know, Rocket was the mean one. Like, he's like, you know, <laughs> he'd be like, oh, you know, like, you know, there's a moment in the first movie where Drax is like, oh, you know, it's like, I tried to do it to save my daughter, but now everything's kind of gone to shit. Rocket's like, well, you shut up. Boo hoo. You know, you got everybody, almost got everybody killed. You know, you don't do that shit. Um, I mean, you know, you don't have him to do that because he's lying on an operating table dying. Uh, you know, that's... You know, because Mantis, like, she leads into, like, like Drax in this movie. There's that one moment. And I'm like, oh, gee. <laughs> and... Because it, it feels like this movie does give everybody kind of like a character moment. But it doesn't always feel like it's built up to... Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Drax gets a, um, you know, like, this is about, like, a little over two-thirds of the way through the movie. You know, Mantis is like, oh, Drax, you just, you mess everything up, you know? You're no good at anything. And then a few minutes later, he gets to be good at something. And while this is, like, a nice one, because it's like, oh, he, you know, like, they find a bunch of kids and cages, and, he, like, you know, he entertains them, he's able to connect with them, he can communicate with them, and it's like, oh, like, this is him being good at something. Mm -hmm. But the timeline of that getting set up and then resolved felt so... felt so fast, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think that was a big... And just even beyond the character beach, just kind of the general story structure felt kind of very like, okay, and this happens, and then this happens, and then it just sort of, things are getting introduced, and it's like, wait, did we know about this before, or did we have any precedent for it happening? And, you know, but, oh, I guess we're here now, so off we go. Yeah. 
You know, it's like, and and it's it's weird because most of these character moments are things that I do end up liking. Like, you know, it's like, like you know, Star Lord. He's like, he decides, oh, you know what? I'm gonna kind of step away from this whole space adventure thing. I'm going to accept that my girlfriend is basically gone. I'm gonna go home, try to reconnect with my grandpa and everything. And that kind of gets like set up, and then they don't really do much with that. And then at the end of the movie, he goes home, and it is a nice scene. Where we see him find his grandpa again, and his grandfather, like, his face lights up, he's like, Peter? Is it you? And it's like, it's like a nice scene, but I wish that it could have been more impactful. Right. It, it just, the last five minutes or so are, are solid, but I, I, and we get two satisfying beats along the way, but I just wish that they had been sort of put together in a more again organic fashion and it's this difference of like having things sort of develop in a way that we're understanding them we're going through the same things as the characters versus just like all right here's these hoops we're gonna jump through off we go and and again it's like it's because i like almost like feel bad you know like like thomas because like you can tell that this movie has a lot of heart in it you can tell that you know people really care about making it I just wish that, you know, I feel like it could have been made into something even better. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how much, because, you know, during the production of this, James Gunn got fired because of some right-wing campaign against him. And then he got reinstated. Um, So I don't know if that caused any trouble, like how much of that might have come through in the final product, because... That was a couple of years ago, so I don't know if there was enough time to smooth everything over. Yeah, we don't know the timeline, but I mean, this is what we have to work with, so that's kind of the only right. thing we can go off. I'm not going to yeah, speculate but... about it. Good point. You know, it's like in the end, we just kind of, kind of go with what we see on the screen. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say, like one, um, yeah, and. Uh, uh, and you know, one more thing that I'll kind of criticize here is that there are times, like you said, you kind of talked about this, like, you know, with it being like, you know, after going into Suicide Squad, which was like a full R rated movie. Mm -hmm. Um, and this one, I did feel like it was kind of being held back at some point, like characters going, screw you, screw you. And you can really tell that they don't want to be saying screw. Yeah. It was interesting, we were talking about Needle Drops earlier, and the opening song is Radiohead's Creep, but they use the, they use the acoustic version, which is fine, obviously, but they use the radio edit, where they say very special instead of fucking special. And I think the song, <laughs> it's one of the rare songs in the whole thing that the, the song I think is appropriate for Rocket to be like listening to, because he's kind of this outsider feeling detached from everything else but i think that using the censored version and obviously they had to use the censored version because it's a pg-13 movie i know how things work but it felt <laughs> emblematic of the rest of the movie kind of being this like neutered version of what either they were going for or just kind of a it sort of dilutes the potency of their original material for me it's it definitely does feel like you know, there again, it could could have been stronger than it was. It feels like it had to be held back. And that song that you described, you know, with it having to be that censored version, very good symbol of that. Um, that said, though, you know, I kind of pivot back to something I did like, and that is like so. The main thrust of the story again is with Rocket, and the villain of that story is the High Evolutionary. And this guy actually, he might be one of my new favorite villains in this franchise. Like, he... <laughs> like, you want a bad guy. Holy shit, this is a bad He's guy. pretty bad. <laughs> um, and because he has both, like, this, like, this... He has both this, like, grand scale of evil, like, billions and billions of people have died because of him. But mm -hmm. he's also just personally vile. Like that, there's this moment where like you know he, you now he shoots, like Lila, 
And the other hand is like right in front of Rocket, and Rocket starts crying. And then the, the guy is like, well, well, you know, you're winning the crying contest now, shut up! And it's just like, oh my god, <laughs> this guy is just awful. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty, like, e very egotistical seems like an understatement. He just does not care about anything else around him and he just wants to modify it all and make it in his image as it were. I just really liked the, um, you know, I had a very, you know, drive that felt powerful enough to kind of carry the story. Um, and I've seen some people say, oh, he, he gets too over the top. But, like, it, it's a James Gunn movie. I feel like that's, that's kind of par for the course. And, yeah, it just, it was so, you know, just the, the whole movie, you're like, oh, I can't wait for this guy to just get what's coming to him. Yeah, I think that it's kind of, I think both him and Will Poulter did a very good job of reading the room and knowing their, what their material is supposed to be. We see, saw the same thing with uh, Lee Pace for Ronin with the first one, where he's just very, this very Shakespearean, not Shakespearean, but crazy, over-the-top megalomaniac who's always firing on all cylinders and so yeah I, th I think that's fine it's entertaining to watch I I just if it was a, it did get a little bit much sometimes when also fucking Mantis is operating at the same like screamy level at points so it's like is everyone <laughs> screaming again why is everyone screaming we can use our inside voices sometimes it's fine <laughs> M Mantis, you know, she's an empath. She can just she she taps into all the emotion. <laughs> her doing her she's like Paul Atreides like fucking weird worm rider thing was <laughs> fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um but also another thing that this movie was so it was really dark for this franchise yeah you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, like, like like you said like you know like you know like the cute little cyborg otter gets shot right in front of rocket and just like and we see the life leave her eyes mm -hmm. Jesus and it's God, like that was dark and then you know the um and then the high evolutionary goes oh you know like i'm done with this planet and so he just like, wipes out, you know, because with it being a parallel of Earth, I'm going to estimate there must have been, like, what, 8 billion people on this planet, Some and they just all amount. die. Yeah, just like, nope, goodbye, I'm done. Uh, you know, and, you know, like, how many people, you know, how many iterations has he done since then? You know, like, or before then? Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, jeez. You know, and, and then at the end, like, when they defeat him, like, they peel his face off. Yeah, that was um, full Paul Verhoeven energy. Just this gross, like, prosthetic thing. And just, ugh. <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Come for the King Hawaiian rolls. Stay for the torturous experimentation and the planetary genocide. That's what they would have wanted. This is... I mean, you can make some great pulled pork sliders off of that. Off of, you know, you have Warpick already. She doesn't have a head anymore. It's fine. Oh, God, no. Uh, yeah, like, this, those, it's those moments where it's just like, okay, like, wow. Kev <laughs> what do you think James Gunn had to do to get Kevin Feige to? <laughs> Maybe this was when they were, like, were desperately trying to rehire him. Because, like, when they fired him, they're like, oh, you know, the... And then they realized they'd been had by, like, this, like, right-wing troll group. And then Gunn was immediately hired by DC afterwards. So they're like, Gunn, please come back. And these are like, okay, I'll come back. But you're going to let me peel off a man's face. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually in my writer for any contract. Remind me to never sign a contract with you. Um... <laughs> also... The most important thing to happen in pop culture, the Marvel Cinematic Universe's very first F-bomb. Oh my god, the shock. Edgy. 
Oh, I will Disney. say, I did like the idea of Peter Quill being a terrible driver. Yeah. It's very entertaining <laughs> to me. And I really like this, this, how they, I guess in a way, like, quote unquote, almost like wasted the F bomb on like this mundane core, that core, this mundane car door gag. And it, it didn't even register to me that it happened. It was just like, like, the, yeah, no, it was, it was just kind of tossed off and all the better for it. I think that's the best kind of joke. It's just, it happens and you don't even realize that it's happened until <laughs> we've moved on. Uh, yeah, it was just like, it, it just was so mundane. And I just, yeah, I, you know, that, I was like, that, that's a fun little bit there. And again, to kind of like, you know, leave off on kind of like a positive note, you know, there's a lot of humanity in a lot of the minor characters here. Like, you know, you have these weird monstrosity looking things, um, but they'll have like personalities and they'll feel like people, you know, they're like, oh, like, oh you know, like, oh, you freed me. And it's like this little blob thing. Um... And those are just like little touches that I think make things feel a bit more real, that make the world feel more lived in, that, I don't know, it's like those are the kinds of things that I like to see. Yeah, and... you get the feeling that he loves all the characters that he's creating, and that it's, there's, he's coming from a place of affection. Absolutely. Even if he loves killing them just as much as he loves making them. <laughs> I was like, you know, you, you gotta make, you know, you know, they tell him, oh, you have to make like a little marketable plushy character, like a little, little fluffy alien thing. He's like, okay, but I'm going to throw it around the spaceship violently at least once. I'm just going to just pee on the floor and <laughs> it'll be fine. There we go. It's the law of equivalent exchange. So, yeah, like, you know, overall, this movie... And like I'm so spent because on the one hand, like it has so much more personality than you know what the studio has been making for the past several years. You know, it feels like because you know, like other movies that have been coming out, you know, have like little flashes here and there, like oh, like you know this or that, and then the studio will take over. Um, feels so bad for Black Widow. <laughs> it's just like have like one good ten minute scene in the middle of it, and then. The studio just takes over and does whatever. And with this one, you can feel like James Gunn is really able to kind of push back. You know, he probably has the weight to say, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do these things. Um, and you can just deal with it. So it has more personality, but at the same time, it is still, unfortunately, very much a mess. Yeah, it just kind of, there's... All the things that he is good at doing as far as he loves these kind of misfit found family dynamics and I think he's allowing that to flourish and I think that again there's a love for the characters, a love for the, the worlds he's creating but I just it's getting affected by wanting to tell too many stories and kind of wanting to pack it all in when I think again just a streamlined let's focus on the whole little rocket thing and use that as the catalyst and maybe you can have offshoots that grow from that of course but it just felt like there were three different things going on and it didn't have to be so harried and kind of frenetic in its, in its uh, execution very true and again you know there's you know we are still kind of we are missing that little small piece of the story in our heads um with holiday special so if we are you know if you know some of the problems we're talking about we're answered in that uh you can call us an idiot in the comments below um but again the best parts of this movie are when gun is allowed to be himself you know he has definite skill with creating these kinds of movies. This is a genre that he's able to really punch above his weight on, I feel like. He's able to do 
interesting things with it. And this movie definitely has a lot of really great stuff in it. Even if it kind of gets bogged down with like too much stuff happening with the other characters, which means that, you know, they don't really get a chance to resolve everything in a, um, in, in a way that feels like fully fleshed out. Mm -hmm. But the Rocket storyline, the core of this movie, pretty strong. Absolutely. Um, yeah, do you have any other thoughts that you want to talk about, like, last minute things? Mm, well, I will say that I had forgotten how much Dog Days Are Over fucking slaps. Finishing up the song with Rocket <laughs> and Groot dancing to Florence and the Machine is great, and that's not even my favorite song off lungs like i'm more of a cosmic love or a um rabbit heart kind of fox but fucking absolute banger and i you know florence the machine can bring about universal peace what can i say yeah, it's pretty good but you know what would have been an even better needle drop uh Baby take shark. on me no <laughs> don't invoke super mario again <laughs> You're really just trying to do some fundamental psychic damage to me today. <laughs> oh, no, I just I felt like your day was going a little too well, it was going so too I had well. to fix it. Like, okay, we gotta even this out. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's our thoughts in this movie. Um, not quite sure yet what we're gonna do for our next one. We have a couple of different ideas. Um, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Rainer, any parting thoughts for the beautiful people out there in cyberspace? Oh, my head's empty right now. I have nothing. Inspiring words. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everybody, and you have a good night. Good night. <laughs>